Today we will wrap up the series of religiosity with the eight considerations that Jesus gave us in Matthew 23, and I would like for us to follow each one of them today. Listen to this devotional and allow God to speak to your heart, because we cannot do it alone, nor should we. Welcome to our devotional, Mana, where we listen to and obey God's word. Okay, want to let you know that beginning Tuesday, we'll begin a spectacular series regarding discouragement. Why do we feel discouraged? What other causes? How do we treat it? What does the Bible tell us? And we will be tremendously edified in the Lord. Okay, what does Matthew 23 tell us? Well, here the Lord speaks of the woes. Woe to you. And in plural, we call these the woes. So, we will see how Jesus here speaks strongly. However, Jesus did not speak this way because he was irritated or angry, but instead because this is a warning. These woes were also common in the Old Testament when the Lord spoke in Habakkuk and Isaiah, where the tone was also very emphatical and spoke of condemnation. Okay, let's begin with the first one in Matthew twenty-three, thirteen. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. And I would say that this first one has to do with the Lord's wishes for us not to be filled with norms or rules in regards to sharing the gospel. Sometimes we forget how we began. Many of us were given the opportunity. Somebody believed in us and shared God's word with us. They spoke to us about God's love. They were patient with us and accompanied us. So in this order of ideas, we may not, we should not use the Bible to condemn people. On the contrary, we must use the Bible for people to be saved. And here the Lord uses a strong text, a strong content against the Pharisees. And this was that their religious life, what it would lead to was that neither they would enter because religion is not the reason why anyone enters heaven. But what was worse is that they were not allowing others to enter. And why? Because through legalism, we're not going to earn anything. We're not going to win, I insist. The only way to win our family and our loved ones for Christ is being of good testimony. Our lives must truly challenge them. We must pray for them. But we cannot live condemning them and telling them that the Bible says that they're going to go to hell if they do not repent. Well, the Bible says that sinners will go to hell. And that is a truth. But if we speak with truth, with love, if we are of good testimony, I believe this path is more effective to lead the hearts of our family, of those who we want to be saved, to Jesus' feet. Okay, the next woe is in verse 14, where it says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore, you'll receive greater condemnation. And so these groups used their religious lives and because they were respected men, men of influence, and people respected them because they were known for being men of God. So they would use God's name to take advantage of the situation. And oftentimes, when the widows were alone, they would take advantage of the situation to take from them their homes, their funds, their riches. But the Bible says that we should never use God's word as a source of income or to earn. The Bible says that we must not preach the gospel with the motivation of money. So it is important for us to understand that God's kingdom is expanded and the funds that a church receives, the tithes, the offerings, the gifts are specifically for the expansion of the kingdom. There cannot be any other motivation because this was the method designed by God. So we must also not take the attitude and say, well, with tithes and offerings, then the pastors are getting rich and there is much injustice around these gifts, tithes and offerings. So there may be cases, but what I've always said through this devotional is that this is not what happens in the majority of cases. I am a firm believer that the majority of pastors with great effort and great dedication dedicating their lives. Today, they serve the Lord and they serve the extension of the kingdom. 
but what must be clear is that we cannot allow anywhere that the preaching of money, the preaching of riches, of prosperity be a priority because this does not lead to any type of edification. So we must not seek a gospel that is constantly speaking to us about prosperity and blessing if it does not lead us to habits and spiritual disciplines that bring us closer to God, to Christ. So it's important that we evaluate this because there are many people who complain there are many people who tell me, Pastor, at my church, it's all about money and they all, they're they always speaking about money. And so we must evaluate these things because I should be in a place where I see that the extension of the kingdom is a reality, where I see that the income is truly being used for what it should, for the expansion of the kingdom. Because precisely, as I mentioned, this is the biblical command. And going back to these men, it says here that they were using their religious position to take advantage and this is not right the third woe is in verse 15 here it says woe to you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte and when he is one you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves and of course the pharisees and these religious groups would go out and make disciples and they would go amongst the people to evangelize. But the problem is that they made these people just as legalistic as they were. And so they taught the same religious culture, that same traditional religion, instead of God's word. And this is sad, because precisely we communicate what we know. And so this is why it is dangerous that having religion, we preach religion, or religious life instead of the essence of God's word. God sends us to make disciples, but disciples of Christ, not disciples of an institution or an organization, nor to teach theories or human traditions. No, God has sent us to preach the gospel of heaven, the gospel of the kingdom, and this is that Christ died, that Christ resurrected, that Christ will come a second time, and that those who are in Christ are new creations. The next woe is in Matthew 23, verses 16 through 22, where it says, Woe to you, blind guides, who say, Whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gold of the temple that sanctifies the gold? The gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold. And whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obliged to perform it, fools and blind, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift. Therefore, he who swears by the altar, swears by it and by all things on it. He who swears by the temple, swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven, swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. In religious culture, it is common to find the method, but not the goal. For example, people end up saying that the temple is what is most important, or the things that should come second are given first place. So if we speak from the point of view of the Lord's word, what is unfailable or mandatory? Well, the biblical principles. If there are norms established in a church or in an institution, that's fine. Because every place must have rules. But when we speak about belonging, as Peter said, when the priest told them that they could not preach the gospel, and Peter said, no, it is priority to obey God's word first before men. For example, people who believe that the temple is everything, so they go to praise, to worship in the temple. But no, the temple is a gathering place, a place where we go, where we love to go place that we appreciate because it is where our spiritual family gathers. But true praise, true worship is not what I carry out in the temple. True praise and worship is what I do with my life, at work, with my family, out in public or in the private places where I go, where I praise God with my life. So I cannot say that I am a worshiper because I go to a temple. No, this is when my mind betrays me with religiosity. And why? Because God wants me to be a worshiper in spirit and in truth. 
and worshipping or praising has nothing to do with a place or a location. And so the Pharisees spoke about the temple, about the altar, and they said, This is sacred. In the Old Testament, there are people who sinned, but they would say, Whoever swears by the temple will not be condemned. But Jeremiah said, There is no such thing. You are making a mistake. Because God is above the temple, we must obey God. So it is not because your religious life tells you that if you have certain parameters, then you will be forgiven. No, sir, no, ma'am. For example, have you seen people who perhaps have a lot of money, but their money is ill-obtained? And with their money, they oppress, they corrupt, and do evil things. But do you know what many of these people do with their religious and their religious minds? Well, they send great sums of money to the churches. And they say, here, so you can do good deeds. Here, so you can help people in the church. But no, people believe that by doing this, then they're redeeming the money they have. They believe that by doing this, then their lives are cleansed because they're helping the poor, the needy, or because they're sending their money to the temple. But no, God does not want our money. God wants our heart. And when our heart is transformed, converted to the Lord, then God receives our money as honor, as gratitude of what we receive. But I cannot replace spiritual things with money. There are those who tell me, Pastor, I'm not going to church, I'm not congregating, but I always send my tithes. But I insist, with sending in your tithes, you are not replacing what is most important in your life. What is most important in your life is to seek God's kingdom and His righteousness. It is for God to occupy first place in your life and in your heart, in your daily life. But it is not about sending your tithes, and with this you have an excuse for not going to church or not praying or not reading the Bible, because here we are adapting the attitude that the Pharisees had. This is why it is so important to understand this point we are touching today. Okay, the following woe, verses 23 and 24. Remember that we are reading Matthew 23. Here it says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done, without leaving others undone, blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Here, when it says that they pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, this means that their tithe was meticulous, considerable. But the Bible also says that it was hypocritical because it was meant to ease the guilt and their lack of attention to the things that are most important of the law. As I just mentioned, they thought that because they were giving, then this would suffice. But no, here the Lord is saying what is most important about the law is justice, mercy, and faith. And this reminds us of what the Bible tells us of what it means to be a true Christian of what it means to be a true child of God. And here the Lord speaks to them forcefully. He says, You strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. In other words, you're giving importance to things that are not relevant, but the things that are relevant, you let pass. And we can... Today we will wrap up this series of religiosity with the eight considerations that Jesus gave us in Matthew 23. And I would like for us to follow each one of them today. Listen to this devotion and allow God to speak to your heart, because we cannot do it alone, nor should we. Welcome to our devotional, Mana, where we listen to and obey God's word. Okay, want to let you know that beginning Tuesday, we'll begin a spectacular series regarding discouragement. Why do we feel discouraged? What are the causes? How do we treat it? What does the Bible tell us? And we will be tremendously edified in the Lord. Okay, what does Matthew 23 tell us? Well, here the Lord speaks of the woes. Woe to you. And in plural, we call these the woes. So, we will see how Jesus here speaks strongly. However, Jesus did not speak this way because he was irritated or angry, but instead because this is a warning. These woes were also common in the Old Testament when the Lord spoke in Habakkuk and Isaiah, where the tone was also very emphatical and spoke of condemnation. Okay, let's begin with the first one in Matthew 23, 13. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven against men. 
for you neither go in yourselves nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. And I would say that this first one has to do with the Lord's wishes for us not to be filled with norms or rules in regards to sharing the gospel. Sometimes we forget how we began. Many of us were given the opportunity. Somebody believed in us and shared God's word with us. They spoke to us about God's love. They were patient with us and accompanied us. So in this order of ideas, we may not, we should not use the Bible to condemn people. On the contrary, we must use the Bible for people to be saved. And here the Lord uses a strong text, a strong content against the Pharisees. And this was that their religious life, what it would lead to was that neither they would enter because religion is not the reason why anyone enters heaven. But what was worse is that they were not allowing others to enter. And why? Because through legalism, we're not going to earn anything. We're not going to win. I insist the only way to win our family and our loved ones for Christ is being of good testimony. Our lives must truly challenge them. We must pray for them. But we cannot live condemning them and telling them that the Bible says that they're going to go to hell if they do not repent. Well, the Bible says that sinners will go to hell. And that is the truth. But if we speak with truth, with love, if we are of good testimony, I believe this path is more effective to lead the hearts of our family, of those who we want to be saved, to Jesus' feet. Okay, the next woe is in verse 14, where it says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore, you'll receive greater condemnation. And so these groups used their religious lives and because they were respected men, men of influence, and people respected them because they were known for being men of God. So they would use God's name to take advantage of the situation. And oftentimes, when the widows were alone, they would take advantage of the situation to take from them their homes, their funds, their riches. But the Bible says that we should never use God's word as a source of income or to earn. The Bible says that we must not preach the gospel with the motivation of money. So it is important for us to understand that God's kingdom is expanded and the funds that a church receives, the tithes, the offerings, the gifts are specific 